we are delighted to uh, welcome you here uh, for this um, absolutely interesting uh, 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 seminar on the leadership style and employment quality, uh, looking at CEO, uh, our managers, uh, male, female, and the type of leadership. Uh, this could actually even extend to organizations, SOAS and other organizations. But a, um, what is um, extremely interesting today uh, is that this paper um, is uh, being presented a, uh, by a very distinguished researcher, one of us here at SOAS University of London, a Dr. Jaydeep Oberoi. Jaydeep uh, is uh, a distinguished researcher, uh, a senior lecturer in finance uh, here in the School of Finance and Management uh, at SOAS. And uh, his research interests uh, are in the field of uh, risk management uh, broadly taken. Uh, and uh, has is uh, has a, a publication, very uh, prolific publisher, uh, covering topics uh, in corporate uh, risk management, especially focusing on interest rate, interest rate risk management, a uh, market microstructure uh, risk estimation and testing, uh, the modeling uh, of uh, long term risks in pension assets. Uh, uh, pensions being a very uh, interesting topic, uh, you know, today uh, in the current uh, financial climate in the UK and globally. But he has also uh, researched some other sources of risk, you know, like risks that uh, uh, originate from uh, demographic change, a uh, uh, climate risk or weather risk, a uh, governance uh, risk. Uh, as indeed we we'll emphasize in this particular paper. And also uh, look at um, um, asset returns, a, um, uh, investigations or modeling of asset returns. A, uh, his research has been funded uh, generously by uh, a number of uh, esteemed research funding agencies, uh, including uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, a, uh, the Global Risk Institute, the National Pension Hub, the Society of Actuaries, uh, you know, for pensions, and the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. And from that, he has also produced uh, not only uh, um, academic uh, papers or articles in high esteemed journals, but he's also produced some uh, publications aimed at um, practitioners uh, and policymakers. Uh, for organizations such as the Society of Actuaries, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, and the National Pension Hub in Toronto. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, today uh, we get insight uh, from a researcher uh, and his team uh, uh, who've been working uh, on this academic paper, but very much inspired by observations uh, from the world of uh, practice and policy. Uh, that he's been engaging in. And so with that, I'd like to have the pleasure of calling upon a, a JD to take us through uh, his paper on leadership style and employment quality. But before um, I do that, let me say, remind you that um, a, please a, a mute a, a, your, um, um, your audio. Uh, just uh, so that um, uh, the background resonance can stop. And then we also uh, ask you to post your comments, feedback, questions in the chat. Uh, uh, and uh, we shall come back to them at the end uh, of Jaydeep's presentation. Or uh, if the comments is pressing, you can put up your hand and then we can interact accordingly. So uh, Jaydeep, uh, you are welcome. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you so much for uh, such a kind uh, introduction. And th uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, this is uh, still uh, somewhat work in progress. We presented in FMA Europe. We got some good uh, feedback there, uh, but but we uh, we would really appreciate any any inputs that you all have uh, during. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt me or uh, to give me feedback before or after the presentation, during or after the presentation. Uh, so so the the, the uh, uh, I'm just going to see if uh, the, the sharing works properly right now. Uh, we tested it earlier. It seemed to be all right, but 
just to make ah, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, so, so yeah, the title of the paper is Leadership Start and Work These Conditions. This, it's kind of a working title. Uh, we, uh, we've been thinking about this from different perspectives, but we want to emphasize, uh, although this paper is very much about gender, it's, it's a little bit uh, broader than that. And so that's why we uh, emphasize leadership style in the, in the, in the title. Um, so, so, so let me um, first of all say that it's uh, a co-authored paper with uh, Timothy King, who's uh, at the University of Vasa, uh, Melania Nika, who's at uh, Queen Mary uh, University of London, and uh, Abhishek uh, Srivastav, who's with the Financial Stability Board. And therefore, uh, it's important for me to say that uh, the views expressed in this paper are those of the authors, and they do not reflect the opinion or the position of the Financial Stability Board. So, uh, so what this what is this paper uh, about, and why uh, why did we do it? So, that, so, so the, the the key point. Uh, I just want to check. Uh, can you hear me all right? Because I've changed the mic that I'm using. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you. can hear you very well. We can so, see the slides present uh, well. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So. Uh, so the, the the key the key point I mean why what what got us thinking about this is that there's a lot of emphasis now since maybe at least uh, the last 13 14 years uh, of really excellent publications providing evidence that from a fundamental from a financial perspective from a performance perspective workplace conditions matter so employee well-being matters uh, and so it's not just a normative question but an actual uh, fact that uh, empirical fact that workplace conditions matter a lot, but it's not always clear. Uh, you know, when we when we make these kind of uh, analysis, where the delineation is. So, for example, on the one hand, workplace conditions matter in a positive sense, uh, because we've found uh, quite a lot of literature showing that uh, you you have uh, uh, firms that have uh, happier employees or or more satisfied employees perform better uh, in competitive environments. From a from financial perspective, uh, from a shareholder perspective, uh, pretty much in every sense. Uh, so, so that's kind of the stakeholder viewpoint. Uh, but there is still, I mean, fundamentally in finance and economics, we have the question of you know uh, the the other side, which is that uh, uh, people like to enjoy the quiet life. So, a lot of times, workplace conditions can be great in firms that are about to fail. So. Uh, just understanding this dynamic more means uh, is kind of important, and I think that's one of the reasons why we decided to dig in a little bit, uh, dig a little bit deeper. And so this is one uh, paper out of like a program of research that we have together, trying to work on uh, on, on this question in 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 a, in a broader sense, which is like the um, uh, the employment uh, uh, environment and uh, how that relates to finance as, as such. Uh, Another sort of like a connection with with with, uh, with this is the, the idea that uh, you know gender and CEO characteristics, gender separately, CEO characteristics separately, uh, but obviously in this case the CEO's gender uh, is also quite uh, broadly studied, and not only the CEO's gender but also the gender of uh, board members. There's quite a lot of interesting literature uh, coming out on that and. And uh, and what the differences are in the characteristics of the CEOs, uh, what their styles are, and so we've got papers from as far back as uh, 2000 at least in finance and economics showing that style matters again for financial performance. Uh, one of one of the uh, one of the things that that comes out from this is that uh, we we has if we can kind of preview the idea that. Female CEOs, for example, are going to be different from male CEOs, and we know that this is, uh, you know, maybe this is going to tell us something about the fact that uh, peop uh, firm uh, firms that are run by female CEOs, for example, might be better at certain things. But from our perspective, that's a bit unsatisfactory, in the sense that, I mean, it's very strange in today's times to say that only men can do certain things and only women can do certain things and certain qualities for example uh, uh, that are let's say uh, that belong to female ceos must also belong to some male ceos and vice versa so trying to dig into this idea of what this average feature is 
that that we we want to understand is is quite uh, is quite important uh, from our perspective. And so we we have a take on it, and I'll try to convince you uh, and see if you if you if you like that take or not. And it's 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 more uh, trying to approach it from a sort of a rational uh, decision making perspective uh, by using a really really simple uh, sort of theory the theory or framework to 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 sort of uh, place this uh, argument or our perspective here right so so the question is what what particular qualities of uh, of the ceo's uh, uh, sort of uh, behavior matter so we know for example some ceos take a lot of risk because they they have characteristics that are more risk taker oriented but that doesn't uh, tell us as much about uh, performance in terms of things like workplace conditions social preferences and so for us social preferences uh, became uh, sort of the key point that we wanted to dig into. And uh, finally, uh, there's another aspect. The, the fact is that even no matter how how interested you are in helping uh, people, and so for example, there were there, there was a paper uh, that was famous about the fact that the when the board uh, uh, gender quotas were introduced uh, in uh, in a specific country in Norway, the the result was that uh, firms stopped uh, the. the the uh, firms fired fewer people. So there's this kind of notion. Then there's the older enjoying the quiet life paper, which says, oh, you know, once the competition and pressure is low, uh, you just like uh, you, you, you become less efficient fundamentally as a firm. So if this if that's the kind of logic, then basically if uh, someone wants to be uh, nice to the employees and uh, just offer a lot of uh, great conditions, Maybe it matters that they have the resources to do that. So how can can the choice of resource allocation make a difference to the uh, to the uh, performance of the firm and to the to the uh, and so to that extent, we want to recognize the fact that there must be some aspect of discretion or slack in the firm's resources that allows you to offer better workplace conditions uh, or not. So that's the context. Uh, uh, a bit long-winded, but I just wanted to sort of place it in why, where we are coming from, because mainly the idea is pretty simple. Uh, I think once you once you see our our uh, sort of starting point, and then the uh, there's a I'm going to show you a whole bunch of regression results that sort of uh, are very consistent with uh, with what we are proposing if you buy our story. Okay, so uh, the question is, from a CSR perspective, there's also uh, there are uh, a, a lot of literature saying, you know, you should if you take a stakeholder perspective, uh, you're you're going to have uh, it's it's kind of again a partially normative viewpoint. Uh, uh, there's there, there's a lot of argument about whether uh, sort of stakeholder orientation leads to better performance as such in firms or not. And there's the the, the key idea that comes out from that is that CSR type of activities are often seen as risk management activities. So uh, it's it's really something that helps you out in a crisis rather than anything else. So so there's a kind of a rational argument for doing it and uh, and, a, and a social argument for doing it. So uh, so again, we are we are uh, coming at it from the point of view of saying uh, employees are key stakeholders. They are like the central stakeholders of the firm. If you think about it, much more important than any other set of stakeholders. And so, uh, because they they are also involved in the uh, like uh, executing the perform uh, sort of the strategy of the firm to make sure it's successful. So from that point of view, if you take uh, 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 the idea of being able to satisfy all employees, make give them really great workplace conditions, you can think of that as a joint incentive, like a collective payment. It's like a social payment to the to the stakeholder group rather than to individual employees. And so that's the way we interpret workplace conditions. We say that's basically a way of uh, compensating employees for something. Now, what is the something? Our argument is that this something is uh, centered around social interaction or the transmission of information between employees or their cooperation or collaboration more so than they would normally do in a very transactional setting. And that's basically uh, our uh, notion of what workplace conditions really do, which is if uh, you, you want everyone to be sort of 
cohesive together, then you need to offer them really great workplace conditions, nice, uh, nice table tennis uh, uh, and pool tables and, you know, a uh, fantastic canteen where everyone can sit together and uh, have a meal. Uh, a lot of things that 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 are basically come under this broader umbrella of workplace conditions, but uh, not just uh, in terms of the ideas that we see uh, from the management literature of workplace conditions, which are uh, which are more about recognizing uh, performance, uh, diversity, and uh, all those things are very very important. But from from our perspective, we are seeing it from a really simple perspective, we're seeing it as a transaction. I mean, it costs money to build all those nice canteens, to replace those beautiful leather couches everywhere, and, uh, you know, pay for pool tables, rent space for employees, offer a sponsorship to their favorite charities, uh, you know, uh, create all the kinds of environment which makes them feel that they belong, and not only with the organization, but with each other. And so that is actually a costly exercise and so we see that as a kind of payment to, to the employees so uh, how are we going to examine all of this the background comes from the idea of leadership style so if we want to think about uh, how uh, you can see whether there is any social preference of the ceo attached to uh, this kind of uh, outcome uh, then and so the outcome by the outcome i mean the, the, the fact that they're, they're trying to encourage uh, social interaction by creating better workplace conditions, then we need to have some uh, further way of dis, uh, sort of disentangling their, their, their choices and their styles. So in the management literature, there is a very, uh, obviously it's a very vast literature and I don't uh, claim to know it perfectly at all, uh, but there's a kind of a broad consensus of these two major styles of management or leadership. One is transformative and transactional. And there's this paper by uh, Judy uh, Rosener from uh, from the Harvard Business Review that's been cited by, I don't know, 10,000 or many, many more people than that, uh, that that kind of really highlighted this, this fundamental difference uh, in terms of how women are leaders are different from men by, by pointing out that uh, basically, women, women believe that employees and peers perform better when they feel part of a group or a cohesive group. And so if if we think about it from the point of view of uh, male leaders, now not all males are going to be transactional, but on average, you would ex uh, you find that they have a more competitive or a transactional orientation where they, they're more focused on pay for performance and a lot of other sort of uh, ideas of efficiency. So, uh, whereas, whereas the, the whole idea uh, for women as leaders is to, to make people uh, sort of want to be there. And so, so that's kind of the fundamental uh, difference between the transformative and transactional leadership styles. And that's what we're going to exploit going forward in this paper. Okay, so before I go forward, I thought, let me just put the framework forward for you just to see how we can, we can take this idea of uh, uh, of social preference of an individual or a leader, and we know that CEOs matter for that, uh, and and see what uh, what what we could get in a in a in a really really simple setting. So imagine that there are just two workers in a in a firm, and they can both exert effort. So it's a simple effort model, okay? And you've got an individual effort, so that means that they just do their job, right? So that's your competitive wage based effort. You you do your uh, you you uh, carry out your effort, uh, uh, and you you receive the competitive market wage for that effort. That's your job. That's your transactional element done, and th that's perfectly fine for you to function as a in a, in your job. But then there's the other uh, side of it. It's a question of how well you work with your uh, colleagues over and above your fundamental uh, uh, like sort of contractual effort. And so that we can call a cooperative effort. Okay, so we think of this as forming links. Now that's costly. I mean, to be fair, it does cost effort and desire to like bake a cake and bring it to the office or or uh, ask your friends and remember people's birthdays and their families' birthdays. You, you, in order to make friends, it costs effort. And if you choose to make friends with your colleagues and you talk to them more and you share information with them more, then there's going to be this element uh, of uh, 
sort of uh, cooperation that comes with some kind of a cost. So we call this effort here simply uh, because of the way the model is uh, set up. Now this um, this effort uh, is different from the competitive effort because if I go out of my way and talk to my colleagues and give them a lot of information about how to do their job better or how something that will help them, then uh, irrespective of whether they do the same to me, whether they reciprocate, uh, there will be some benefit from what I've done. So there's a kind of an externality coming from my cooperative effort, which is not coming from my individual effort. OK, so both of us would benefit basically from my cooperative effort. And so the simple setup we have in this model is like a basic uh, kind of a business dilemma uh, type of setup. So let me just uh, show you the, the, the payoff matrix here. So if the first employee can choose just not to cooperate and do their cooperative uh, non-cooperative effort, and uh, then the sec and the second employee could do the same, then each of them will receive their wage minus the cost of an effort, and that's their basic uh, payoff. Now, if one of the two employees, so the first employee, uh, does not make any effort, but the second one does, then the the bit, both employees will get this extra payment S two, but one of them will also bear the cost of this uh, of pro I'm sorry, of pro providing this extra payment. Uh, extra effort. And uh, basically, you can see that this is a typical simple prisoner's dilemma problem. Uh, and then if you uh, and you, you can see that you'll end up with a Nash equilibrium uh, in the first box uh, with a couple of assumptions that I haven't yet told you, which is that basically we, we make the assumption that this uh, extra benefit S is not bigger than the individual cost of providing uh, uh, of cooperating. But S1 plus S2, which is what you would get if you both uh, provided the effort, a uh, cooperative effort, is bigger than the individual's cost of providing the cooperative effort. So essentially, if they both cooperate, we have a Pareto optimal situation, right? But they won't. So partly because uh, uh, it's basically not uh, not not efficient for them to to do so. Okay, so your it's your standard uh, prisoner's dilemma dilemma problem. Uh, we've just made one small tweak in this uh, assumption. I'm sorry, I I was in the way of the slide there. Uh, that that uh, that the the cost of providing the shared effort is bigger than the benefit from only when only one person provides the shared effort, but smaller than the benefit when both provide the shared effort. And that's that's basically the simple assumption. OK, so if we had that assumption. Then uh, we can bring in the benefit, uh, the, the preferences of the CEO and we say, OK, if the, what if the CEO actually values this shared effort? OK, and what? Uh, so like we said, if you are, if you have a transformative style, then you would genuinely value the shared effort. Whereas if you had a transactional style, then you would be focused on efficiency and you wouldn't really care about the shared effort. So we uh, so we can think of uh, uh, two CEOs, right? Where naturally uh, they uh, the the one type of CEO, the transactional one, doesn't uh, care about the shared effort, but the uh, but the transformative one uh, has. Puts, puts a value on the shared effort and that's uh, and therefore uh, they would they would like uh, to, uh, to 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 see this uh, uh, to see this effort executed and the simple assumption for that is uh, uh, you know uh, you, you, for for the for the CEO to be able to uh, sort of uh, uh, make this effort possible to to support this effort uh they they would need to exert a cost now the co the uh, and that cost as far as we are concerned is the workplace conditions in a, in a sense so if they make this cost uh, uh they, they spend the money 
uh, to make it possible for people to collaborate easily, then what happens is that the 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 total cost of collab uh, cooperation falls for the individual employees. And if we go back to the to the to this uh, situation, we end up in the Pareto optimal situation because the employees now uh, do not. Uh, 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 the, we basically what we've done is reduce the cost C of L1 and C of L2 uh, to a level where it's now optimal for the employees to cooperate. OK, so it's it's, it's really like a, a simple, simple, super simple uh, model, but the, the it, it makes it uh, sort of clear what what's going on. The the manager can make it possible for people to collaborate and cooperate at a lower cost to themselves by creating the conditions that where they can do that better uh, at some cost to themselves. Now, the 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 manager uh, who would not uh, want to spend this cost is the one who's transactional in nature. The manager who would be happy to spend this because they want this cooperation to take place is uh, what we call the transformative CEO. And so the, so the, the fundamental uh, 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 argument is that if the manager prefers an international internal environment with cooperation, they'll reduce the cost of individual social effort and you'll end up with more uh, transformative environment, more cooperation, a shared common vision. And uh, whereas the competitive uh, or transactional CEO will focus more on the individual uh, uh, effort and therefore you would end up with uh, less cooperation. OK, so uh, if you can reduce the cost of co uh, cooperation to a point where it's less than the benefit from a single person co making the cooperative effort, then you end up with a Pareto optimal outcome. And so that's where the CEO's actions make the make the difference. So because the we now we we're writing F here for female, uh, so that's kind of previewing what comes. Uh, because the female CEO prefers has a positive value for uh, the social uh, uh, effort, social uh, be benefit, she will make this expense. Okay, so she will spend this uh, extra cost uh, or this utility for providing that, like by using up her slack, as long as she uh, she values it enough, and that's basically what this uh, condition says. OK, so uh, that's that's the the basic background of uh, of the of the model. Uh, I have a huge uh, uh, sort of set of uh, 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 sort of uh, background to go into, which I, I kind of uh, avoid right now. But just to give you a rough idea, uh, there's 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 a very very strong uh, uh, literature highlighting the difference between females and males as managers in terms of their uh, in, the, in their leadership style. And it all comes down to the fact that on average, women have a more authentic transformative leadership style. They want to inspire people. They, they value uh, cohesion, whereas uh, uh, men have a more contingent reward uh, sort of management by exception uh, type of leadership style. Uh, so on average, uh, they, uh, they they don't necessarily uh, 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 spend, uh, would not necessarily have that uh, extra value, of, uh, utility value from the social uh, conditions to invest in, in, uh, in uh, employment conditions. So as a result, our, our hypothesis is fundamentally that we should see on average a difference between male and female CEOs uh, so in the in the employment quality of the firms that are run by male and female CEOs, and we would expect a higher employment quality in female run firms uh, based on our logic. So now I hope I hope that you're uh, uh, following along with this. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward model, but still maybe I haven't explained it perfectly. So if uh, if there's any questions, I could stop for a moment. No. So going well, thank you, thank you, uh, JD. Okay, excellent, thanks. So, uh, so then, hello. Sorry, Vasilis wants to unmute and uh, ask his question. Ah, Vasilos, yeah. yes, uh, yeah, please come in. 
Thank you, Victor and Athena. Uh, Zaydeep, I was wondering if in the slides where you, I mean, one of the agents is putting more effort and that effort has a cost L and has a benefit S. So I was wondering if there is any scope of uncertainty for that benefit. Is that measured accurately? So do, do they know the agents how much they're going to receive or? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a very very good question. So so this is uh, kind of a contingent reward uh, setup, right? So we would imagine if this model was dynamic, that we would have this setting where someone would have to credibly commit to giving them uh, excellent conditions, if uh, you know they 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 in turn reciprocate with each other and so on. But because it's such a simple uh, framework, we don't have the flexibility to do something like that here. So we're, we're just trying to make like a really, really simple point. So that's why we haven't gone into like a dynamic model like that. But that's a really good question. Uh, credibility of the commitment to offer these conditions. That's part of that. That would be the case in a dynamic setting. And in that case, you would have that uncertainty. Exactly the one that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. So yeah, so what what we did then so is basically to go and test it on the data. And so we said, let's get uh, as much data as possible. So we went across uh, sort of uh, using CompuStat global. We went for uh, uh, as as broadly as we could globally with uh, as many countries as we could capture. Uh, and the the key criteria were, of course, that the data had to be available for for all the all the different variables, but. We, we used Bordex for the uh, CEO uh, gender and the governance variables. Uh, we used uh, country level economic indicators because it's an international sample. And uh, the, the key factor, of course, was to get some good measure of employment quality. And what we settled on was the Thompson Asset 4 database, uh, which has which is basically an ESG kind of database, but it has a separate pillar in it, uh, which is uh, related to social measures. And within that, there's a there's a specific section on employment quality, which uh, is defined as uh, um, among other things, it says clearly that it measures the company's management commitment and effectiveness. So both commitment and effectiveness towards providing high quality employment benefits and job conditions. Now within this, there was like the job conditions, the way they're explained and described uh, matches quite well with what uh, what we were looking for. So so that's the variable that we ended up uh, picking up. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. We, we did look at the different components of it as well. And uh, basically we have about 22,000 plus observations, firm year observations uh, for, for this data over, over a 20 year period. So it's, it's a pretty decent uh, data sample. Uh, and uh, the first thing we did, of course, is to just simply uh, run a fixed effects uh, regression, not just one, several like with time effects, uh, country effects, industry effects, industry and time fixed effects, country and time fixed effects. And uh, the, the dependent variable was the employment quality. We had a dummy for the fem uh, for the gender of the CEO. So if, uh, if it's a female CEO, it, uh, it's equal to one and a whole bunch of firm controls. Now, these are the things that people have found in the literature that uh, are related to employment quality. So, uh, so the return on equity of the firm, the profitability uh, metrics, uh, uh, the uh, leverage, uh, so, so some kind of constraint idea, uh, Tobin's Q, uh, investment, uh, capital expenditure, our, uh, re research and development investment, I'm sorry, uh, capital expenditure, all of these scaled by assets, uh, asset tangibility, GDP per capita, uh, GDP growth rate for for the for the country level uh, indicators, uh, and and so the, the the kinds of things that you would expect in 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 this regression, we we use all of those to control. Uh, we control for all of those factors, and what we found was just as a kind of a core summary that irrespective of which uh, regression you look at, so all these different variants. Uh, uh, a one uh, unit increase. So, so moving from a male to a female CEO doesn't make sense. One unit increase. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, leads to a 2.5 to 2.7 percentage point improvement in the uh, uh, EQ score. Now, this EQ score is on a scale. It's like a scaled measure. So, it's uh, uh, it goes from uh, minus one to one, and so. Uh, 
So, so it's not a huge difference, which is something we should not expect uh, a huge difference because of, uh, after all, it's not a dichotomous differentiation here. Females and males are not that different that we would expect a completely different uh, behavior by them, but they're sufficiently different that we can treat the female uh, as a proxy for a transformative CEO, and we can see a significant and uh, consistent difference between the, the two types of firms, uh, whether they're run by females or males in the employment quality scores. So on average, female run firms have higher employment quality scores than male run firms. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the standard fixed effect regression. Um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's handy. But there's also like obviously people will ask about all kinds of endogeneity and uh, uh, typical uh, your your typical concerns uh, about uh, you know uh, causality and so on. So uh, I I don't have this uh, the I I don't have that particular table here. But I should point out that we also uh, did a couple of instrumental variable uh, checks. And so uh, one for example uh, was uh, was based on. Uh, you know, what was the uh, gender uh, equality at the, when the CEO would, the average age, let's say of the CEO is 50, would have been in their 20s. So like a, like a kind of a cleaner instrument for the conditions under which the firm uh, uh, operates. And uh, those kind of instruments also uh, worked, worked uh, gave us very consistent results. But more important than that, and I think this is this is probably uh, the most uh, convincing uh, uh, sort of evidence that we have uh, as far as far as uh, one would uh, one would look if you're looking for uh, sort of uh, look at addressing endogeneity is to look simply at what happens when the CEO changes. So uh, this is not a, an exact difference in difference type of analysis, but it's in that spirit. The idea was to literally look at uh, when a, a male CEO is replaced by a female CEO uh, or when a female CEO is replaced by a male CEO. And uh, of course, uh, the alternative situation is when it's a male to male uh, change uh, or a female to female change. And here we see that when we uh, take uh, run either a panel regression or we do this kind of uh, collapse analysis like in an event style pre uh, turnover and post turnover irrespective of which way we do it we see that when a male ceo is replaced by a female ceo the employment quality score of the firm improves whereas when a female ceo is replaced by a male ceo it actually falls so you can see that the the on, on the one hand you have an increase in the employment quality score in the male to female turnover uh, after the, uh, the change has taken place and uh, a reduction in this score after a male has been appointed. So uh, this we thought was quite uh, quite uh, convincing uh, evidence uh, of, of the same of the same result. So he, the, the key thing that we were looking for, like more or less we have some evidence that it's uh, we we can see that uh, Female CEOs are associated with higher uh, employment quality scores, and if you buy the uh, the, the two connections that we've uh, had to get to here, which is about uh, you know the the employment quality score is uh, somewhat, uh, I mean that was the, the our hypothesis that is is somewhat related to the social preferences of the CEO, and so therefore they're transformative versus uh, uh, transactional leadership style, and that. Uh, uh, there's given the, the 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 amount of evidence we have that females are good proxies for transformative leaders, then we have this this much so far that uh, employment quality in uh, firms led by transformative leaders is uh, tends to be higher. Now, uh, just to try and like challenge ourselves a little bit in terms of exactly whether the channels that we are suspecting are the ones that uh, show up in the in the in the data. Uh, we 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 think about all the other sort of related 
possible uh, scenarios uh, in terms of uh, how, whether we can find sort of uh, so we, we we can challenge really uh, this this idea a little bit more. So we do a bunch of subsample analysis from that perspective. So if you think about it, if the labor market, let's think of, let's think about labor market and competition conditions first. If the labor market is really rigid, right, then you have situations where uh, it's uh, more difficult to hire and fire people, and you have uh, a lot more uh, sort of uh, uh, challenge in terms of uh, basically uh, whether you're you're going to uh, well whether you're going to be uh, need to let's say. Uh, offer uh, excellent uh, working conditions or not. Similarly, if uh, the labor intensity of your firm is really high, so not labor market, that's a national feature. So I'm talking about situations where the labor market is rigid or not rigid, depending on what the country level indicator is at the particular point in time. Uh, labor intensity, on the other hand, is more focused on uh, the firm level, so is the firm uh, or the industry that the firm operates in uh, more dependent on workers? So is the labor intensity higher in that type of firm? Now, if the labor intensity is higher in that firm, no matter whether you're male or female CEO, you're going to have to really compete for workers. And so uh, we want to know when is it that the female or the male CEO's uh, sort of style kicks into action to generate this difference that we've seen on the aggregate data set. And similarly for industry competition, when the, when the, when the competition is really high, you, you expect uh, slack to be low, which means that uh, any manager would be focused very much on efficiency. And so their leadership style would, uh, would only kick in uh, uh, based on their social preferences, simply because they just don't have the ability to uh, uh, to sort of give away money, let's say. Okay, so these are all conditions under which certain types of constraints related to people or markets are uh, imposed on the on the manager. And so we, we did a check in all of these things by separating them into uh, sub samples of low and high uh, for each of these categories. Now, if you look at uh, uh, labor intensity, for example, when labor intensity is high, there's actually not much of a difference between female and male CEOs because uh, even the male CEOs will know that they need to provide this kind of uh, excellent conditions to uh, to the workers. But when the labor intensity of the firms is low, that's when you notice that the uh, female CEO has a bigger impact on a positive impact on employment quality statistically significantly different from the male counterparts. The same thing applies for labor market rigidity, right? So when, when the labor market is uh, very rigid, uh, then hiring and firing is very difficult. But when, it's, when it's, it's much more fluid, you, can, you need to attract, uh, uh, you, you can lose employees, but it's also uh, easy to fire them. You again see, that the uh, that the female CEO has has an impact. If you look at uh, comparative conditions, now we find that uh, an an odd result here. So that's why I've highlighted both uh, uh, low and high. Uh, in high comparative conditions, where you would uh, where you would really see the social preference like really biting, you have the strongest uh, sort of coefficient so far. Uh, in terms of uh, the female CEO having a positive impact on employment quality conditions, whereas uh, for some reason it's the opposite in low competition environments. But I'm not that surprised by this because you know Matza and Miller's paper, there's other papers that have shown, uh, and I was talking about this earlier about the fact that when the competition is low, you tend to be a little bit more uh, relaxed about uh, using resources for making employees happy. And uh, maybe in that setting, we see that uh, female CEOs go a bit further. They're a bit more soft, let's say. They care a bit more. 
they'll be more hesitant to uh, fire people and so on, and uh, more happy to just share the resources because there's less competitive pressure on them. So it's not entirely inconsistent, but it's like a, a weak 10% uh, uh, significance uh, level uh, negative sign there. So women being even more generous than men. Uh, so less generous than men, sorry, in, in, in this setting. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so, so that's the, the competitive constraints angle, both at the national level, at the industry level differences. Then there's the other side, uh, which uh, also relates to the same things that I just mentioned is the agency cost uh, approach. So if the firm has a lot of slack, uh, what, how would they deal with uh, uh, this situation? Do they have uh, lots of cash holding or are they constrained with respect to their capital expenditure? Uh, do they have a lot of free cash flow? Uh, those, are, those are different uh, firm level uh, sort of proxies for agency uh, costs. Whereas uh, on the other hand, you have, uh, uh, the anti self dealing index, which is uh, more of a, an agency cost international comparison with, where you look at uh, laws and you see uh, if uh, firms have uh, a greater ability to uh, do self dealing, then there's uh, less uh, uh, good governance uh, or fewer constraints on the on the managers. So in this particular type of setting, again, we find that when it's about free cash flows, when the firm is more constrained, you can see that's when the uh, the female CEO's preference kicks in. When the firm has lower cash holdings, again, more constrained. When it has lower capex, again, more constrained. And so we see that consistently, uh, that's where really uh, the, the, where the differences are significant. And in the other case, they're not significant, which is also not, uh, you know, it's kind of reassuring in a sense that we are not. I, I got a comment once about this pa uh, paper that uh, you're just looking at like mediocre men versus exceptional females, and if that were the case, then we would not, we would not, we would see a slightly different result in the uh, in these uh, alternative subsamples. So in the in the high subsamples, it would not be uh, how it is. So it would be not not be insignificant. So it's not that the men are mediocre, they just have different preferences. And so I just want to hi uh, highlight that, uh, not because uh, uh, I represent the male side of things, but simply because uh, I think it would be unsatisfactory for us to say, okay, the solution is just like either, uh, uh, either you, just, you just hire more, more women. Of course, that's fundamentally an important solution because they're underrepresented, underrepresented. But uh, you, you, what you need to, uh, to do is to learn from their style and to understand when and how they make a difference. And that actually gives you a bigger advantage and a better motive to, to encourage the employment of uh, female CEOs, for example, because of the, the, the impact that they have, because they're, they're fundamentally, uh, they have a different style. Uh, and, and, and you can see that on average, at least in the data. Okay, so uh, when it comes to the anti-self dealing index, this is a national level static measure. We didn't find anything uh, like we found just marginal statistical significance. I don't really know what uh, to make of it. Uh, it's it's clear that in the in the countries which are slightly better governed, uh, let's say the uh, the coefficient value is higher, but uh, I I don't know if that that tells us much at this point. Uh, and so then we come to the uh, to the to the to the last aspect, which is what what is the cultural context? Uh, how does that contribute to uh, to the when when are women more likely to have an impact on the employment quality? And so uh, we used Hofstede's uh, cultural dimensions uh, to 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 do this kind of analysis. And so you uh, we we know these uh, these kind of dimensions quite well, right? So um, power distance is about how uh, the people who have less uh, power in the society are accepting of the fact that they have a greater distance in the power with, with those who are more powerful. So, so there's, uh, there's, there's a greater kind of authoritarianism uh, in the society. And we find that uh, when this authoritarianism is low, that means the, con this, uh, the social conditions are conducive to women being able to exercise their style of leadership, you find a higher you find the impact of the female CEOs 
Whereas when uh, the power distance is high, uh, there's no impact. In fact, it's a statistically insignificant number, which is not surprising because in that kind of environment you would expect, and this is totally just guesswork, so please don't uh, hold me to it, but uh, you would expect that female uh, CEOs would be obliged to, uh, uh, to act in a similar way uh, to the male uh, counterparts in order to succeed and to get appointed to their jobs. Uh, and then the same thing applies with the, with masculinity and femininity. So in uh, masculinity and femi uh, femininity, the dimension in uh, Hofstede's cultural differences is the cultures where uh, uh, that are more masculine have a more competitive en edge where, and cultures that are more feminine have, an, uh, have the idea of like kind of a work-life balance or a desire to enjoy what you do. And so again, you find that when the, the cultures are more feminine, uh, then uh, the female CEO's impact is more uh, visible and, uh, and measurable. Uh, uncertainty avoidance, we were not sure where this is, uh, how this is going to impact. So we had, we had a sort of a, 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 a kind of a, a hypothesis, but it was more, uh, 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 sort of more uh, vague, let's say, it, uh, is uh, simply where, uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, culture where uh, the structures are a bit more rigid. So in the sense that uh, people have more rules about how to interpret each other's behavior in high uncertainty avoidance uh, culture. So, uh, so deviating from, from the norm is more difficult to do in a high uncertainty avoidance culture. And so uh, uh, when that is not the case, so in uh, cultures that, are, that have a bit more flexibility uh, in terms of people's interactions, again, we find that's when the female CEOs have a bigger impact. Uh, now, in terms of restraint versus indulgence, it's just literally short term versus long term uh, uh, desired self control, really. Uh, and here we find that uh, you know there's not much of a difference, and it's it's very uh, again it would have been difficult if we had found a difference to to explain it or justify it. So 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 I'm I'm not uh, I'm not totally displeased by uh, by this result. So. Uh, that's basically the the the, the, the set of sub samples that we had uh, that I promised you I would, we would look at. We were trying to see whether really when are female CEOs uh, impactful in their employment quality? Is it in the conditions in which it's possible for them to do it? Uh, do they do it in the presence of constraints? And so if they do, then we have a stronger case for our argument that it's their social preferences and their transformative leadership style that's driving this behavior, and that's what we found. Now, what about uh, the components of employment quality? Can they give us a clue? So the employment quality score of Thompson Asset 4 has different uh, uh, sub uh, parts that add up into the total final score, and uh, they, they come in the form of training and development, diversity and opportunity, and health and safety. Now, if you look at this, you would say health and safety is the most regulated aspect out of these three things. It's the one thing where, uh, you know, everyone has to do it. And again, you see that in the health and safety measure, females and males are not different. So uh, this, the, the effect uh, of female CEOs on employment quality or on, on health and safety scores is not different. But where it is different is in the parts which involve uh, sort of better uh, uh, conditions from from an employee welfare perspective, which is beyond just this, the the fundamental uh, security and safety regulations. And uh, again, you can see that in both those cases, the 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 female CEOs uh, have a statistically significant uh, impact on the on on on, on the uh, employment quality uh, on these individual sub uh, sub measures as well. So that's basically uh, sort of a, a, a rough a kind of a tour of uh, all our results. Uh, so I can I can summarize. I think I'm just in time, just about uh, two o'clock. So uh, hopefully that gives us a good amount of time to have some discussion. Uh, the 
the key thing that we wanted to uh, sort of emphasize is that the social preferences of the CEO could impact employment quality. So what we did was to come up with a uh, to to sort of uh, show with a sort of basic theoretical framework uh, how this could uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, manifest itself. Uh, and uh, the, so we we showed that that and we sort of highlighted that uh, the conditions under which this could happen are related to uh, constraints as well. And so the where where uh, so so and we we see that subsequently in the subsample analysis that this is the case. We do see that if we treat females as a proxy for people with social preferences that are more transform transformative, leadership oriented, then uh, then then you do get the result that we uh, expected, and uh, and sort of this the the, the sub constraint oriented uh, points were of course that when agency costs are low, excuse me. And in cultural uh, in in settings where the cultural barriers to uh, females being able to exercise their management style uh, are uh, are lower, so the cultural barriers are lower. That's exactly where you find uh, that the impact of the leadership style is the strongest on the employment quality. So that's that's uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, absolutely um, 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 interesting and engaging. So uh, we give you a hand of applause, uh, um, uh, Jaydeep. And uh, this was a uh, very, very interesting, uh, relevant to uh, the current discourse on a, a special leadership of um, and uh, CEOs of um, a organizations and uh, you know large companies. I, uh, what is impressive is the way you motivated the paper and the work, um, and also uh, your coverage of literature, uh, excursion into uh, game theory and the payoffs, uh, depending on the behavior of the uh, uh, CEOs and uh, whether the CEOs, um, you know, transactional or transformative. Then, uh, of course, then uh, formulating uh, the model <clears throat> and using um, a very rich, uh, you know, a data source. Uh, these are some of the important data sources that the Center for Global Finance subscribes to. But you expanded that data source, and you are able to uh, distill uh, some uh, interesting uh, results uh, from it. Uh, I think it just uh, will excite a lot of discussion uh, uh, here, but also in terms of uh, the research work uh, that uh, colleagues in the network. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm backing on whether they are coming from a, a management or from a finance. There is quite a lot to to, to do here. Um, you know, uh, one could even uh, you know control for you know company financial standing, uh, you know rating uh, whether the rating agency is able to capture this uh, dichotomy that you mentioned. Uh, whether you know um, the big rating agencies, uh, you know, which ratings, models, standard poor. I have advanced the understanding of our companies to look into these uh, uh, leadership um, uh, uh, challenges and uh, gendered uh, leadership, um, you know, kind of challenges. Um, uh, absolutely exciting, uh, and um, I uh, also um, the variations you have put into the paper, you know, like looking at uh, you know cultural issues. Um, you use uh, uh, the well-tested uh, uh, Hofstede cultural dimensions. Uh, um, um, although these are tested and uh, you know uh, uh, being heavily criticized at the moment, I think there are also other ways of extending this into other uh, definitions or other measures, other metrics or yardsticks of uh, you know national culture. But very very interesting. I think what I should do now is uh, just uh, open the discussion to the floor. I can see a, um, already uh, some comments uh, in the uh, chat room. A, uh, maybe I should uh, invite a, some people from uh, the chat room to um, voice their views, and then we go to the uh, show of hands. So I will invite a, a Lefire Maleka a, and then a Hongbo. Uh, um, in terms of the um, 
a, um, of the comments in the chat, and then I come to the show of hands. I can see Kirian's hand is already up. Okay, so um, um, uh, Refirwe uh, uh, refer Maleka, would you like to um, uh, share the comments you posted in the chats? Sure. Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you very much for this presentation. I think that DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion has been quite topical over the last couple of years in terms of a key factor that is expected to play um, a huge contribution towards unlocking value for companies. So I have two questions which I've posted on the chat in case you just need to refer back. And the first one is an extension of Hong Bo's question where I'm wondering about the impact of generational diversity on transformation and the overall performance of organizations. I know that it might not necessarily have been a focus for, for your research, but it, I just I was just wondering about that. And then secondly, um, I'm not sure if I could have missed this, was there a correlation between the levels of ethics and governance on and, and gender in leadership? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the for the question. First of all, thank you, Victor, for uh, really the the suggestions you gave about the the company's uh, uh, rating standing and the the cultural metrics that we could uh, look into. So so I've, I've noted those down. Uh, 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 th uh, thanks for your questions. They're, they're quite interesting. I, I think uh, it's 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 a bit uh, difficult to think about uh, the transformation. Uh, p potential arising from generational diversity simply uh, uh, there, there there's lots of industrial differences and there's lots of other differences that come up uh, in terms of the typical age of the CEO in different uh, in different industries uh, so I'm not sure whether we would be able to sort of exploit uh, the data sufficiently we would have enough sort of differences in the data to be able to capture that uh, diversity. But I'm uh, I'm sure we're going to look at it now that you've uh, brought it up. It's uh, it, it's it's an interesting idea. We we did use an instrument uh, which was based on uh, you know you know how much potential uh, a female might have had, for example, growing up thinking about whether she could be a CEO, right? So so that's that's an instrument that's been used uh, in the past in the literature. So we just basically borrowed the idea from uh, from another paper. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the conditions that we were looking at were such that they uh, they, they tried to separate out uh, whether a female has the flexibility to act in a certain uh, environment and whether she can exercise her uh, uh, style of leadership in, uh, sufficiently. And uh, whether, uh, so from a generational perspective, the question becomes, can, can they do that? Uh, 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 is is there going to be like a, a, a change in the is is there a trend in in a sense that we are looking at so so is it going to be that the the younger and the younger generations are going to be more open to female leadership i mean that's it's it's a bit of a broad question and i don't yet have the answer to it but we'll, we'll look into that data to uh, uh, do the data see if we can uh, sort of tease anything out from there the other question that's also very uh, interesting which is about wh whether there's a correlation between ethics or so the governance standards of the firms and whether the female, uh, whether it's more likely that a well-governed firm is going to have a female CEO. That's another thing that we haven't looked at. So that's something we, we will try to check. But what we haven't done is the kind of analysis where we're predicting the probability of a female CEO being hired. What we've tried to do is as much as possible control for the situations where uh, the endogeneity uh, arises in the sense that a, a firm that's got good employment quality conditions is more likely to hire a female CEO. So that's something that we kind of almost assumed. And you asked us the, uh, a question to check. Have we made that assumption correctly? So we we thought that that's a, a natural source of endogeneity. A firm which has, you know, which is better employment quality conditions is probably going to be more friendly 
towards uh, females and therefore females will choose to work there and therefore they would be the ones uh, they're more likely to be a female CEO as well. And when there's a female CEO, she will, uh, you know, create better conditions such that more females will join the firm and there's more likely to have a female CEO. So that's the kind of thing that we control for. Now, whether we should be thinking about measuring how likely this is going to be, uh, that's something we haven't looked at and, and we will. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Rafi, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Jaydeep, uh, for the response and the discussion. I think the uh, the other comment uh, uh, in the chat uh, was uh, uh, from Hong, um, and then I will come to a um, uh, the participants who have put their hands up. So, a uh, Hong. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think uh, you know the reason why I put it on the chat probably is to avoid, uh, you know, being asked, but now I'm here. So thanks, uh, Jadeep, for your presentation. I think you um, um, you did uh, quite a lot of, uh, you know, tests uh, in different aspects. So cultural, um, labor market, uh, and other external factors. But my question is really about what exactly the root reason that can explain the differences in, you know, women CEO and men CEO. So for me, it's more like a demogra demographical finance. And so it's more related to the traits of CEOs. And then, of course, external conditions can change, can shape managerial styles in addition to the to that treat. So I think maybe in your theoretical part, you may mention the literature that talks about women CEOs, gender differences, the implication of them um, to um, for uh, management, for example. And, and that's basically my concern. And I think um, I like uh, the conclusion and the idea, but you will have some problems uh, with uh, men CEOs, probably. <laughs> yeah, but there are there are a lot of factors. Yeah, but thank you very much. I enjoyed. Thank, thank you, Hong. So, so yeah, indeed, in the, the in the paper we spell out a little bit more about exactly the underlying differences in the preferences of the females and male C uh, in general. And then there's a literature which shows that in the management, uh, so among managers. The difference between females and males are not necessarily exactly the same as they are in the general population, and so so we've looked at all that, sort of incorporated it, and then basic. Uh, but but uh, what what we argue is that essentially, as a proxy over a twenty year period of the data that we have, uh, you know, where not that much has necessarily changed, it's it's a reasonable proxy simply for the social preferences, and that's the only kind of claim we are making. Uh, and from that point of view, the, the preferences are simply that one prefers cooperation and cohesion and the other not as much uh, as a group on average. And so so that's uh, so. And for that, we've tried to create uh, we've tried to produce uh, uh, basically most of the literature for that is, as you said, it's from uh, from a different field. It's not from finance. So we've had to cite papers from uh, from a lot of uh, um, organizational behavior, management, leadership, uh, that aspect. To, to cover this, these arguments. So yeah, so thanks for that. I'm going to sort of emphasize also this demographic aspect in terms of the, yeah. the, 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 the generational factors as well. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, Hong. And I think uh, coming into the discussion, you are able to expand on uh, your views and also get a contribution that uh, Jaydeep has uh, acknowledged and uh, uh, will appear in the uh, ongoing work. And uh, thank you, Jaydeep, for the response. Uh, we continue the discussion. We have two hands up. Uh, one uh, is uh, Karen and uh, then um, uh, uh, Godfrey. Uh, so um, Karen first and then Godfrey second. So uh, yes, thanks very much, Jadip. I really enjoyed the paper. Um, and um, I thought there was really quite a lot there. And in, in fact, I thought there were two papers there, really, which is what I'm going, I'm going to uh, talk about in a way, because um, one paper I thought tested your model, and the other paper dealt with uh, male fe female uh, distinctions and so on. Um, 
in, in terms of, of testing your model, it seems to me that um, you could test it by looking at the characteristics of the labor process. So if the labor process is such that um, there's an incentive for the CEO to actually put these things in place, um, then that would test your model. And you could test that to, I mean, uh, so for example, if I go down to Mayfair and I find an advertising boutique with leather filters, I'm not surprised, right? So it's it's because the kind of people who work in that in that area have a labor process determines whether it's worthwhile or not to um, to to install these things. So I would think that you know characteristics like whether the whether the industry is creative, whether it's client facing, whether there's uncertainty. These there, there must be data on on these that could be used in place of your male female distinction, which would test the model adequately. And um, the reason why I say that is because I think there, there, there are issues associated with the male-female distinction that, uh, you know, you're placing a lot on the maintained hypothesis that these differences in styles exist. And that may be true in the management literature, they may accept that. But there's also a huge literature in gender studies, which doesn't actually buy this stuff very much and, and, uh, and ha would have different maintained hypotheses. So, you could check whether the male female um, was proxying for something else by doing a simple logic maybe on the characteristics of the firms that have um, the female leadership. And I know you've tried to in deal with endogeneity by looking at the change from male female, the switch and, and, and uh, female to male, but I wonder if that actually overcomes it because often that change will be triggered by something. So, for example, uh, the choice of a female leader may be simply a signal by the by the board when they've had some kind of reputation problem or so on. And because there's this um, idea in the air that females are different in some respect, then the, there may be the decision to actually appoint a female. So the, you have to endogenize the actual choice of, uh, of, of gender of, of CEOs as well. I think if you were to deal with that completely, but I think um, you, you know, there's a huge amount there, and you've done a huge amount on on both of these aspects. I just wonder whether a referee might come back and say that uh, there's there's two papers, and and maybe uh, we should separate them. Thanks very much for the paper. Thank you so much, uh, Kiran. I mean, those are really uh, helpful points. I, I might actually pick your brains on the uh, citation references from the gender studies area uh, in terms of the. Uh, the uh, the other features of the industry, I think that's really helpful. We what we did was look at things like uh, labor intensity, which we thought might kind of proxy for some of the features that you were talking about. So the reliance on the the employees, and so in that we find that when when the labor intensity is high, actually there are not that many differences between the managers. So that, because that's when they have the incentive to provide the conditions that you, uh, you know, which is what you rightly uh, said. You sh you shouldn't necessarily find any differences at that kind of situation. But you you do find them when the labor intensity is not that high. So um, uh, of course, well, maybe we should be looking at other features of the industry, things like uh, creativity and uh, innovation and uh, R and D expenditures, different ways of breaking the subsample to see if that uh, you know if, if we can test the hypothesis that way. But in the end, we need some way of differentiating between the social preferences of the CEOs and finding some uh, good proxy for that is very challenging. So, um, so that's why we went with this. There was there was a paper that looked at uh, socialization effects. So, so they uh, in uh, what they published, uh, what they did was they actually looked at CEOs who had female daughters, uh, uh, and that that was kind of their way of uh, looking at their social preferences. And they found that their ESG scores and CSR scores were higher if they had female uh, children uh, compared to those who didn't. So, uh, so there is a kind of a female socialization hypothesis uh, out there that's uh, uh, well accepted in the finance literature as well, but not. Uh, but as you said, I mean, it's not. Uh, this, this this is something it does hang on the proxy, and uh, we have to we have to look at a, another way of capturing that. Uh, in terms of the endogeneity in, transi in the transition, yes, so we we're kind of like we are stuck with that. Uh, there is a problem of uh, the fact that the CEO, female CEO, might be selected simply because of her characteristics in the when the transition takes place. So, uh, so that's why we don't 
completely rely on that result. So uh, we we treat that as one uh, part of the the, the 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 analysis, but not not the only one. So we are doing some more IV type of analysis, but. Uh, as Rifilwe mentioned earlier, and you're mentioning as well, I think it might it obviously makes sense just to, to do a low jet and check first the, the 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 likelihood that a female will be hired in the firm. So we so we'll do it uh, we'll do it that way as well. Thanks again. Uh, thank you both, uh, Kirian and uh, um, uh, Jaydeep, for uh, the exchange of views and for uh, possible extensions of the paper. Or oh, indeed, there was also a suggestion of splitting the paper in two, two, whichever uh, uh, works uh, better for the um, uh, for the completeness of the study. Um, uh, comments from a uh, um, uh, Godfrey. Hello, Please can you um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah, Thank my um, my question stems from um, the statement you made earlier um, while presenting the paper that. Uh, when males are replaced by female um, CEOs, that what the performance of the company um, increases? Is that uh, so the employment fair quality, reason? The employment quality score increases. So that's the, the what the, score? The what score? The employment quality score. So the working condition. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because uh, well, still, I think these questions um, still apply. Um, what, did you find any? Um, trends in the data and that you know i know that look the paper is already doing so much and it's an excellent paper so uh in a way some of these questions might even be unfair but did you um in your sub samples look at any trending behavior um you know before like for example during the male tenure were there any trends in other words let's say there was an upward trend in that variable during the male tenure, and then the, the male was replaced by a female, you know, the female, uh, and the, the, the trend continues. Of course, the trend would go up um, even higher once the female uh, takes over. That's one question. And uh, the other thing I question I have here is um, the, the danger that some of these things could be driven by outliers so um did you consider looking at the median sc score you know uh in that way you kind of immunize yourself from the possibility that there might be an outlier industry outlier female per se that kind of drives some of this and i, I look i don't want to come across here like i'm some kind of um uh, you know, males, um, what I, forgot, I can't find a proper word right now, so I better don't say it, anything. But I, I, my suspicion is that particular aspect of your paper will be seized upon immediately. At least if I was, a, that, I, it is so fascinating that it will come under tremendous scrutiny. And I just want to make sure that you're ready for it. You have it all robustified, you know, and. Uh, when people like me, for example, ask questions like I'm asking that you're ready to um, to rebut. Thank Absolutely, you. I think uh, uh, and a very interesting paper has, you know, knives already out for uh, <laughs> uh, 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 this is how uh, uh, the referring process works. Uh, so let's close uh, all the uh, yeah, uh, all the possible loopholes. Thank you. Yeah, JD. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. And I mean, I, I actually held my hands up right while talking about the transition analysis because I, we know it's a bit limited. So we, it's not a proper difference in difference. We haven't done the the sort of trends before and after. So it's uh, it's something that we, we still need to explore. So what we did try to do was control for CEO tenure, for example. So that's one way of uh, sort of addressing this to an extent. If, if, if a, for example, if a male CEO has been in the job for 15 years and then is replaced by a female CEO versus if they were in the job for two years, then you would expect different uh, different outcomes. But but yeah, so if we want to sort of really rely on that result, we'll have to do what you're saying. Absolutely. So we are, and we're, we're working on that. We're trying to we're trying to uh, redo the analysis with a bit more data because the last time we did this was about two years ago. Mm. Uh, so we uh, so so once we had, when we do that, we are going to add all these features in, into the analysis. Okay, and in, in, a, in a third paper, evidently, because people are talking about two papers, 
Uh, I can't see you uh, adding that <laughs> on the current paper. That might be too much overload. I think yeah, I think that uh, that that is a third paper, independently important third paper, at least from my not so humble opinion. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, indeed. Uh, thank you both. Um, and um, um, there was a handout uh, from. Uh, Slight to me from Kerry University Business School, but it appears he has left the uh, meeting. So uh, I go the next one, which is a uh, you know Vasileos. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, Jaydeep. Hey, Vasily. Uh, thank, thank you. It was very nice presentation and actually very very topical and interesting interesting topic. Um, my comment is on one of your slides where, OK, basically you, you want to have a statistically significant female CEO that's 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 taken. And of course, you you do that. My next question would be what kind of drivers or what kind of channels and you would relate to that female CEO being significant. And you, you, you showed the slide that you were, I think, talking about some Hofstede measures on power distance or on uncertainty avoidance. So I wanted a little bit more story around there, like what are these properties that really make this female CEO dummy be statistically significant? And once properly inserted into the model, the female CEO should not be significant. So on your slide there, in, in a sense, you are controlling for them because you split the sample into high and low. Uh, but I noticed down there the observations were not really comparable, but then you switched the slide. So I was wondering on your views. Let me just, on, yeah, let me, let me just take a look at uh, see if I can go back to that slide. Uh, this is the one you had in mind. So yeah, indeed, the yeah. The, the observations are split at the median. So uh, there's so basically because these are country level measures. Uh -huh. uh, okay. So we have more firms in some countries and fewer firms in other countries. So that's where the sample sizes are different. Uh, across but if the, they are median splits, I would expect the same. Median of the median of the measure, which is country level, but there are more. So, okay. so there are some the there are more countries uh, with fewer firms in one set sample, and then uh, the equal number of countries, let's say, in both samples, mm -hmm. but fewer firms in one uh, one sample than the other, simply because the the sample uh, representation across countries is uh, is not equal. So there's a there's a much, and that's one of the weaknesses. That's one of the things that we are working on right now is to uh, uh, improve the balance in the sample because uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, there's too much emphasis on the US and the UK uh, in in the in the data. So it's the, uh, so as a result, so if if the, wherever the US sits in the sample, mm -hmm. there's a there's an imbalance in that in that side of the data across firms. Now, in terms of wh whether it is um, uh, the, what the, the story behind that is simply because our argument is that it's about the social preferences and the leadership style. Now, uh, only in a setting where you can actually execute that style, is that style going to make a difference? So when the culture allows you to execute your style, it's more likely that you will be able to see the impact of that, that difference. So uh, supposing you're in, a, in an environment where you, you can't possibly, you just, you're just so constrained that you cannot be different as a female compared to the way males manage things, then you're not going to find that difference, even though you might have a preference for it. So your preferences get represent, uh, sort of like manifested only when you have the ability to manifest them. And so culturally, in some cultures, it's just not possible for females to act differently. And so that's what we discover from the Hofstede uh, sort of cultural difference angle. Would that it, also be true for industries? Uh, that's a good question, and so we haven't we haven't explored that. So it, it could be that, like for example, construction or engineering industry might be might have a different culture than the software industry. Yeah, that's 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 a really good point. I mean, we uh, we should, but I don't know. Is there? Do you know of a measure for culture in industries? I I, I would I would think your database. Uh, what is that? The asset the Thomson asset four. 
Would it have that, anything yeah. like that? I don't think we found something like that, but we'll, we'll, we'll look again. Maybe what we can do is we can do an average of the female diversity score for firms in a particular industry and then use that average as a way of uh, score, scoring that industry as being more uh, uh, diversity oriented or not and so on. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of, uh, yeah. Th thanks for that suggestion. I'll, I'll, we'll explore. I mean, I, I, ideally you would need some some variables or some measures at, at the individual level or perhaps at the at the company level yeah so we take the I, company I level think. scores yeah and then we we average them for each industry and then we we use that to use the, the, the score of the industry basically so we could do that okay so maybe if these are at the at the can at the at the company level so how the company is promoting some policies or you know, something that if if you left uncontrolled for, then eventually the female CEO dummy would be capturing. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. Yeah, no, I understand completely what you're saying. But so, I understand the problems of getting these. We have to find a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to find a way of doing this because it's um uh, yeah, but but it's a, it's a good point that the culture is not necessarily only restricted uh the sub sub subdivided by country. Uh, or region, but also it could be divided by the industry itself, and so that's something we'll 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 try and see if we can explore that. Yeah. But thanks again, Mas. Well, thanks. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I did, and uh, thanks for um, yeah keeping up the discussion, uh, JD. Um, let me check uh, in the chat. Um, I don't see um, uh, any further comments on the ch in the chat. I I don't see uh, any more hands up. I um, uh, here uh, so, but um, Jaydeep, I'm I'm not sure whether any of your co-authors uh, is uh, present and whether. They would like to uh, add uh, a couple of words to the discussion. So, so Tim is right here. I just uh, let me just introduce him because I think he hasn't appeared since the yeah. seminar yeah. started. So yeah. he's what uh, he's he's visiting uh, us at SOAS right now from uh, from Vasa, where he's a professor in uh, finance. Uh, so, so yeah, so he's been uh, listening, and uh, I think he's kind of sounds like you're uh, okay with that. Yeah, thanks everyone for the comments. Very constructive. Um, if you have any further feedback, you'd like to feed back to us by email, we're happy to receive it. Uh, we're currently working on revising the paper, in fact, this afternoon, so going to oh. write some new regressions, <laughs> uh, taking into account some of the comments uh, given to us today. So thanks very much, everyone, and uh, thanks for attending, and thanks very much for your comments. And uh, thanks for uh, also being able to participate in these papers, you know, as a co-author and of course as a visitor at uh, at SOAS. So uh, most welcome. Um, yeah, I, I think um, um, they uh, will have received the paper very well. There is a you know great uh, insight in um, in this paper, and of course uh, kicking off new ground for you know active research, a, a huge amount of data, a um, a strong arguments a, uh, that support um, the uh, role of uh, a women CEOs, a, um, pointing out many areas that um, a, uh, people both in finance and management could go into, a, um, a, and uh, some of our you know, ongoing work, for example, a, on the role of national culture in a, a uh, bank risk taking behavior um, of banks, I th of, uh, bank risk taking behavior, you know, of our big global banks, a uh, um, could as well be informed by looking at the, you know, these gender differences. A uh, um, so, um, you know, much welcome, much welcome, very great paper, well done, well done. Okay, uh, so. Um, uh, I see that um, no further uh, comments, reaction. Uh, uh, so, um, yes, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to conclude uh, this seminar. Uh, uh, to uh, thank you, uh, JD, and your co-authors for the great paper. 
uh, uh, best wishes in uh, revising the paper for a definitely, you know, a great journal uh, um, uh, during uh, uh, your stay, the course stay at uh, SOAS. Uh, so um, uh, we look forward to uh, another uh, exciting uh, presentation uh, uh, next week, uh, uh, which will be uh, led uh, by um, a, um, uh, Aisha Demir, uh, 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 who is within uh, the uh, audience lead, uh, affiliated also Center for Global Finance at uh, uh, SOAS, uh, and also uh, Joseph Alefo, uh, who is a researcher at Northumbria University. And that will be next week, uh, next Wednesday, same time at one o'clock. So for now, thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, and uh, we end up with the, let me use the ski. Yeah, yes, yeah, so the applause, uh, which we all give a hand of applause uh, to. Thank you so much.